connected by purpose, driven by passion. This is Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which includes this Spark Live webinar series, the Spark Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. To learn more about Children's Healthcare Canada, you can go to our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can sign up for our weekly Spark newsletter at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca slash email, where you will learn about upcoming events, read the latest posts from our blog, and other exciting news and events from across the child and youth healthcare community. And welcome to today's episode of uh, Spark Live uh, uh, from Children's Healthcare Canada, our webinar series, where we curate, convene, and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community uh, to spark conversation, ideas, and action. And since we are live on these sessions, I do want to remind everyone that you do have the opportunity to type in questions at any time during the session. Don't feel you need to wait until we call for questions. Just type them in as you think of them. Then we have them there. We can put them all together for our speakers when they're ready to uh, to call to take any questions. Uh, so, and also don't hes hesitate to share any of your thoughts on Twitter and be sure to tag us at Child Health Can. Uh, today's uh, Bell Let's Talk Day, uh, as a matter of fact. So, uh, Children's Healthcare Canada has a number of uh, tweets going out related to that. Uh, uh, the, the, the Bell Let's Talk hashtag. So uh, don't hesitate to throw some comments related to this webinar in there as well. Uh, all right. Uh, so today we are talking about improving health system navigation for patients and families, a collective community impact approach. Uh, and uh, it's really our pleasure to welcome back, in fact, two speakers who have uh, are, who are no strangers to our webinar program over the many years back when we were CAFC and now into our Children's Healthcare Canada webinar series. Uh, first, uh, uh, I'll introduce uh, Dr. David uh, Nicholas, who is a professor in the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Calgary. His, although it's the University of Calgary, he is at the Edmonton uh, Division, and he's also cross-appointed to the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta. And also joining us is Dr. Lucy Locke, who you might have heard just a couple weeks ago uh, with one of our webinars uh, from our colleagues at Childbright. Uh, she was here with her uh, colleagues talking about the Strongest Families program. And that webinar, as always, is record has been recorded and is available on the Knowledge Exchange Network if you want to go uh, check that out. But Dr. Locke is a uh, an associate professor in the School of Social Work uh, and is also an associate member of the Departments of Pediatrics, Neurology and Neurosurgery at the Faculty of Medicine at McGill University. University. So uh, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium uh, over to Lucy. And we'll get you uh, the controls there. Okay, thanks so much, Doug. Uh, show my screen. Is that uh, we're on? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, we're And thank you to those who are out there um, who've taken some time to listen to what David and I have to say about a really exciting project that we have been We've initiated, so we're very much at the beginning stages, but we thought we would um, bring to you where we're at and what we've learned so far. This is a project that's been funded, uh, generously funded by Kids Brain Health Network, as well as the Israeli Foundation. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. in addition, let's see, I'm having some problem moving my slide mm -hmm. here. Oh, here we go. We have many partners across Canada who've been involved and have contributed to date almost too numerous to mention, but these are some of the names. Uh, they have contributed intellectually and they have also contributed their time, uh, both in kind, and there are many partners that have also contributed uh, in, in cash and we'll be acknowledging them as we go along the way. So our objectives for today are to talk to you about this idea of navigation, which seems to be picking up some steam, particularly here in Canada. Um, in the literature and uh, speak to you about what the under our current understanding of navigation is. Uh, we'll be describing to you four uh, projects um, or projects that are occurring in four jurisdictions, three of which are on the West Coast and one here in Quebec, that we've just started and what we have learned to date. 
So the idea of navigation is something in the literature that has um, attributed to Dr. Harold Freeman in 1990 as a strategy that uh, he used to improve compliance or adherence to breast cancer care among African American women. Uh, in, in, in his sort of formulation of it, a navigator facilitated access to services um, in cancer care, accompanying the patient to follow up appointments, uh, while at the same time providing emotional support, education and advocacy. And what he found um, was that in, in, uh, in his sample was that there, were there was an increase in the rates of early diagnosis and a decrease in late diagnosis in cancer care, which of course are, are really positive and wonderful findings. Um, but actually, I, um, David and I have been thinking a bit about this with our teams, and we kind of see things a little bit differently. Um, with navigation, I think, has some precursors in, um, in, in, the, in nursing and in social work. Uh, as early as the 1900s, uh, case management was picked up by public health nurses. Uh, and social work emerged as a discipline that was that focused on linking or brokering healthcare services. Uh, nursing models, um, they, what they did is they both provided care delivery and coordination. So the focus was really on supporting those with long-term chronic illnesses um, that were being managed in outpatient community-based settings. Um, but in the 1980s, there was some pushback to the uh, to the use of the term case management as as uh, patients did not um, take kindly to the idea of being case managed. And uh, the term care coordination um, and family care coordination emerged on the scene um, where there were the, there were there was more of an integration of principles of family centered care. And there's some people that have done some great thinking about this, uh, Carl Dunst and Carol Trevette in the US. But here in Canada, we have Barry Trout, um, who was at the University of Calgary, Diane Hebert Murphy at the University of Manitoba, Peter Rosenbaum and his colleagues at uh, Canchild. Um, that, and, and family care coordination really incorporated the notion of you know, brokering services on behalf of patients, of mediating services, and in, in cases where there was limited service, um, advocating and uh, and developing resources for, for families. But now we're seeing this emergence of this idea of navigation and um, in the literature, it's being defined in various ways. Um, again, uh, here is a definition that was used by um, uh, folks at the University of New Brunswick. It's a process of collaboration between a professional who could be a nurse or a social worker, or it could be a lay person um, with a patient and his or her family and or caregivers to provide navigational support, including education, emotional support, logistical guidance, as they attempt to navigate through a complicated maze of services, treatments, clinical interventions, and or programs. So you see that the definition is quite broad. We have another one here that was developed um, looking outside of pediatrics at navigation. Nancy Carter and her colleagues at the School of Nursing at McMaster conducted a scoping review of the literature on navigation and they were they were more specifically interested in mapping navigation models in the context of primary care. So this wasn't specific to neurodisabilities or pediatrics. And they defined navigation as something an individual or a team do or engage in that address uh, these, these, uh, these aspects of, of care, which is facilitating access, promoting, facilitating continuity, identifying and removing barriers and ensuring effective and efficient use. So you can see the term is broadening. Um, in this slide, uh, what we have are um, some of the results from a, 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 pediat a scan that was conducted, an environmental scan that was conducted by um, Allison Luke, Shelley Doucette, and Rima Azar from the University of New Brunswick and from Mount Allison. They identified 19 pediatric navigation programs in Canada and described what they, what they saw. So basically there are navigation programs that target specific conditions like diabetes or cancer or sickle cell. 
Um, then uh, there are programs that are transdiagnostic and and uh, go across, uh, you know aren't specific to to a diagnosis. Um, these programs will target um, different groups. Uh, seven of the 19 were were uh, developed to support those from Indigenous First Nations or Inuit communi- communities. 15 out of the 19 were actually hospital based as opposed to community based. And 11 were focused very specifically on the transition from hospital to community. The navigator role varied um, from providing education, uh, support and assistance in accessing resources, both from within the healthcare system and outside of the healthcare system. Um, And six were specifically uh, focused on the context of there, it being interprofessional and at times an intersectoral team. And we'll be speaking some more about that, the significance of that a little bit later on. Um, the navigation models, let's see, they were um, 19 or sorry, 12 out of the 34 uh, were um, delivered by non-professionals or community health workers. 10 were delivered by nurses, um, either advanced practice nurses or registered nurses, and nine were um, delivered by a team. So navigation being provided by a team where social workers were a part of the team, but none were actually led by social workers. All right, and here was the kind of the competencies that they that they these programs looked for in their navigators. They looked for people with experience, with skills, you know, desirable traits and uh, knowledge of the healthcare system, knowledge of specific diseases uh, and related community resources. In some cases, knowledge of mental health and addictions, legal issues, support services, and in some cases, bilingualism was was important. So these, uh, this is speaks to what this the um, the quality of the science is around evaluating navigation. At least in in Carter's review, um, there were eleven out of the thirty four that were descriptive studies. Nine were qualitative, and only seven used quantitative methods. And of those seven, three three were randomized control trials. One was non randomized. Two were cross sectional, and one was a pro- program evaluation. And when we think about, okay, so what difference does navigation, what, what, what is it supposed to, what difference is it supposed to make? What, how is it supposed to help both the individuals as well as the systems? Um, and so the outcomes give us some clue as to what difference navigation is supposed to make. Um, it's supposed to, the, these are the outcomes that were evaluated. To what extent did these navigation models or navigation programs change or improve uh, individual self-efficacy, uh, self-management of the disease or the disorder? Uh, did, it, did it result in more timely access to care? Um, were people more satisfied with the care that they received? And here's where the questions around cost effectiveness um, uh, come in. In other words, were there fewer emergency room visits and fewer hospitalizations if um, navigation was provided. They also looked at um, uh, outcomes for caregivers, like uh, was was there decreased caregiver uh, depressive symptoms, uh, decreased caregiver strain, improved quality of life and well-being. In another study by McBrien, uh, Carrie McBrien and colleagues, again, from the University of Calgary, another made in Canada uh, study of a systematic review of patient navigator programs, uh, where they looked at 67 unique studies in 74 publications, and 44 were in cancer care and diabetes. So again, outside of the field of pediatrics, which we have a lot to learn from. Um, they defined a patient navigator as a person with or without a healthcare related background that engaged with patients on an individual basis to determine barriers. Um, and these are the kind of outcomes that they looked at, uh, whether uh, rates of death, uh, uh, levels of hypoglycemia, uh, quality of life and health status, as well as these kind of surrogate, what they called surrogate outcomes. Uh, secondary outcomes, did, did those who received navigation 
Were they more likely to complete the screening process, complete the diagnostic procedures within a specific period of time, and beginning to look at whether it decreases costs. So 57 to 86 percent of the studies reported a gain in some of uh, or in one or more of these primary outcomes. So here we have um, uh, some are uh, some of our own reflections are where, on where things are at um, in the context of kids and more specifically kids with brain based developmental disorders or neuro disabilities. We have talked, um, David and I have done some work in speaking to, to service providers and to parents about their needs. And let's think a little bit about how what's here maps onto um, what's being provided. So families are saying that they need are systems of care that are connected and that are adequately equipped to meet the needs of children and their families. And what, from a family's or parent perspective, this means not just a transition episode from the hospital to the community, but actually um, what happens in the lives of these children and families when they're not in the hospital, when they're at home, when kids are going to school, when they're in their playgrounds. And so what that requires is a breaking down of silos that exist between the education, health and social care sectors as well as between levels of, of care, uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary care, as well as between types of care, um, assessment or diagnostic services versus treatment or rehab and supportive services. These, the fact that these silos exist is, should not be a surprise to anyone. We all know they exist. And it's, been, it's very challenging as there are not really a, a many incentives built into the systems for those systems to collaborate uh, with one another. But from a parent and family perspective, their reality is that they are navigating these complex and multiple levels of care and sectors. Parents also identify an, a strong need to have a go-to person um, that is known to them and that that go-to person knows that they are the go-to person. Um, and that this is somebody who helps them to move between these silos and sectors and levels of, and types of care. Um, there, there's uh, also a need from a systems perspective for there to be uh, uh, some kind of threshold of knowledge about the realities of these of children with neuro disabilities, what their needs are and what their families' needs are. And so there's an, a need for building capacity through training. Um, and, and maybe even, I would say, as, as we are learning, using the assets that exist in communities to provide that training. And finally, parents are saying, what parents are saying to us that they need are parent-to-parent -parent connections. That there's something that parents do for parents that no service provider or healthcare professional can do for them. There are things that they can say in, in to one another or speak about with one another and learn about from one another that, um, that is, is, they find extremely helpful. And that these, these connections are particularly important during, during times of transition. So at times when parents are, you know, when their child is going from preschool or from daycare into school in, into primary school or transition to high school the the possibility of learning from a parent who is a who has a child who's a few years ahead of their own learning from them their the wisdoms and and their take homes and passing that along to to them so in summary, uh, what we've learned from the literature and from families is that there's not a lot uh, that's known about navigation in pediatrics and certainly not a lot in neurodisabilities. Um, that there is an emphasis on um, uh, you know, providing navigation within the context of a single diagnosis and maybe a single sector, but not much across sectors. Um, and this term navigation has, is, is in its current status really broadly interpreted. Um, and so there's the, we're asking more questions than and, and providing answers at this point um, about uh, the ways in which this term is being used. So, so caregiver 
um, appears to be something that parents do in terms of navigating rough waters. It's a maritime term, which is kind of interesting. Um, and uh, we, we, we've done some thinking as well about that. But the navigation, or is, is navigation actually something that an, a navigator does? So is it something that a parent experiences or does? Or is it something that somebody designated as a navigator does? Or is navigation something that should be focused around key transitions um, where there's an emphasis on accessing something? Uh, and certainly this idea that there are a limited number of studies um, and outcomes. Uh, so at this point, um, I think, do I? No, I guess this is still my slide. Uh, that it, Okay, so navigation prog programs really still vary depending on the, um, the condition that's targeted, on the community characteristics and the needs, on the type of system where navigation is needed, and on the modality of delivery, whether it's to face versus telephone versus online. So what we're doing at this phase in our work is really opening up the idea of navigation being a contingent term, um, and that it and that it has the uh, potential for local definition, or um, or being defined locally in a way that makes sense for a community or context that there's no one size fits all. Um, and that's where we've landed so far, uh, but it doesn't mean that it's willy nilly and can be anything. And I think as we move forward, we're gonna begin to define what are the principles that, uh, that underlie um, navigation programs or services. And we will be developing a way of thinking about navigation that, uh, that will be helpful uh, to others. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to David uh, to, to move forward with the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I, privileged to be uh, with you all on, on this webinar. And, and we, we wanted to recognize that this kind of work, is, as Lucy has spoken about, really is multi-layered and, and to that end, recognize the leadership of Kids Brain Health Network. Um, and, and really speaking to both the vision to move forward at, at the, this broad level of the intersections of, of sectors and organizations and systems um, and, and provide a, a backbone leadership with, which really seems critical in moving forward. So Kids Brain Health Network, as you see on the screen, is a, a cross-Canada collaboration among centers of excellence with, with multiple investigators and associates, universities, nonprofits, uh, government agencies, industry partners, and, and a host of wonderful trainees. So, it, it, and uh, that, that has been really critical in terms of moving this, this, this area forward collectively and, and with, with an aim of focusing on impact and, and ultimately a scale and, 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 and advancing a knowledge in terms of informing uh, communities in terms of what works for them. And what, where that has led us is to um, an initiative that really is a, a collection of four pilots, uh, and they are regional in focus. Uh, they are interlinked. We work closely together, but, but independent uh, projects aimed at supporting families as they navigate service systems. And we'll talk a little more about them. Uh, and, and really, the focus is, is, uh, is understanding and innovation and moving to impact and sustainability. So really thinking about how can this contribute to the discussion across Canada and various jurisdictions uh, with different areas of, of strength, gaps, and, and, and uh, foci in terms of moving forward. And, and so our aim is to really uh, uh, elicit the both process and outcomes, evaluate and share findings across Canada with the, with the, the aim and hope of, of impact. So uh, improve uh, continuity of care and, and really pathways and options in terms of, uh, of, of the, the process to service for families, which uh, in turn speaks to improve quality of life for children and their families 
uh, service capacity and efficiency, and, and ultimately sustainability and scaling of innovation, which is a focus of, of, of the work of, of partners, uh, which we are grateful for, Kids Brain Health Network and the Israeli Foundation. So let me focus on, on our uh, initiative sites. So these, these pictures of these beautiful communities, uh, uh, Edmonton, Vancouver, Whitehorse, and Whitehorse is focused uh, on rural communities in the Yukon and Montreal, who have recently come on stream. And, uh, and what, what the focus looks like in these initiatives, and I'll walk through this busy slide, uh, hopefully methodically. So if we start on the, at the bottom of that triangle, where we're, we're wanting to get to, or move from and get to is really moving from the fragmentation of services that can be experienced by families as they try to get what they want. So they may be families with a child with a neuro disability such as autism or FASD or cerebral palsy or, or, or an, another neuro disability. Uh, and so moving from uh, getting services but finding fragmentation to rather coordination and access what Andrew speaks to as uh, getting what someone needs when they need it, which is the aim. And, and, and what, what that takes us to really is to the top of the slide or the pyramid, which is innovation, sustainability, and true impact in the lives of families. That's our aim. And, and what that requires in, in this uh, particular initiative across these, these four exemplar sites is a, a range of activities. So uh, that uh, with the triangle, you see some of those broad-based activities, uh, which are nuanced within each region relative to the priorities of that region. But the, uh, at the bottom level, the broadest level of the triangle, uh, activity one is determination of service and support needs. And those are various activities within regions that really speak to um, an environmental scanning of the resources, the, both the strengths and the gaps and the opportunities for moving forward, and partnership building, which a lot of effort has gone into in terms of thinking about who are the partners across a services, agencies, sectors, including having a strong family voice in that process. Um, and secondly, above that is uh, thinking about uh, model development, uh, which in, in our, variably in our, in our uh, examples, we focus more on understanding what is versus moving towards uh, a model development prematurely and really thinking about regional needs and fit and community engagement, taking that time to really build the relational components that are so integral in terms of thinking about moving forward in the complexity of navigation, given all the partners that are part of that process. And lastly, where we're seeking to go is model implementation. And one of our sites, you'll, you'll hear about that, is actually already focusing in that area. To that end, we, are, uh, we, we have appreciated the support and the engagement and partnership of, of the Tamarack Institute who have met with us. And uh, we, are, we have really uh, appreciated and, and, and been supported by the collective community impact approach. Uh, and uh, and if, there, if people are familiar with that approach, there are kind of five broad-based elements. And I'll briefly speak to them, but uh, we don't have the time to go into a lot of depth. But, but first of all, uh, collective impact speaks to a common agenda that takes time to work through in terms of thinking about partnership engagement. So what is it that we collectively want to move towards? And then shared measurement, which uh, will vary across uh, sites, but there, there may be elements of, of commonality that can be gleaned. So we, we have some benchmarks of, from where we've come into where we're going and how will we adjudicate and calibrate that. And, and mutually reinforcing activities that pivot and allow us to move towards our, our common agenda and aims. And then a, a, a robust system of communication so that we work together well and, and, and uh, are, are working towards being on uh, the same page in terms of moving forward step by step. And, and lastly, a strong backbone support uh, in terms of 
some of the, the administrative pieces that allow this work to move forward constructively. So one of the key markers along the way was a, an exciting meeting where we came together. Uh, you'll see the sign and a little bit of the backdrop of the, the beautiful territory of Canada called the Yukon. And uh, we met there as a collective. Uh, uh, each site had representatives who, who came together. And, um, and these were some of the, the elements of that collective meeting that we just wanted to put on the table because these are our critical issues that we have grappled with uh, and continue to grapple with. So the experiences of children with neural uh, disabilities and their families. So what is the process for families? And hearing well the voices of families as they, they uh, navigate the complexity of the systems they, they need to navigate. Um, and and what are the resources and, and navigation processes within particular jurisdictions? Where are we now and where do we, what's our dream in terms of where we need to get to? Uh, and and how, does, how is that process facilitated uh, for families? We spoke about care coordination and, and uh, an integrated approach uh, that uh, is, is happening at Alberta Children's Hospital as a pilot, which is which is a, a terrific exemplar. Uh, we, we, we grappled with the methodology of collective impact and its application in specific sites. And, and uh, we, we were uh, honored to be part of uh, and, and to be presented to by First Nations uh, communities in the Yukon and really thinking carefully around the, about the, the the, the pathways and the navigational processes as it is reflected uh, by different jurisdictions and populations. So if we think about uh, urban and rural pathways and different populations and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the pathways that, that are required in terms of people uh, getting what they need in community and as Lucy spoke to the transitions from our potentially tertiary sites to uh, communities which may not be in our urban centers, but distant and rural uh, locations. How do we do that well? Uh, we we um, need to just acknowledge and, uh, uh, the, the leadership and the trailblazing work of the Fetal Alcohol Resource Program offered by Citizen Advocacy in Ottawa, uh, which really inspired this work. And, um, and, and we some of the navigation innovation uh, and, and looked at that and lastly spoke at that at that meeting together in the Yukon in terms of regional project progress, the aims and the markers of moving forward. Let me talk a little bit about some of that detail. So the, the Edmonton pilot, uh, uh, which really focuses on Edmonton and central and northern Alberta, uh, and, and with the aim of improving, improving transition and navigational services across the continuum of care, really is focusing on what are the sectors, what are the organizations uh, and, and ministries, so uh, government, uh, non-government, uh, other service providers, what are the, and families, what are the, the, the partners in terms of that continuum of care? And, and there has been a process to examine the systems and the partners in that really build capacity uh, and in, in terms of existing systems and, and build that capacity in moving forward. So there's been a real focus on uh, identifying and extending the partnerships in terms of uh, system integration. So in terms of progress to date um, amongst the, the uh, Edmonton and the Alberta team, there has been significant work in terms of stakeholder and partner uh, engagement um, and, and focusing on the plan revision and, and refining of the plan and moving forward on a continual understanding and partners, partnering with stakeholders, and, and including families as they identify their, their needs and values. Um, there has been a uh, infrastructural development of research and community engagement working groups and, and analysis of present state, a scoping review of different models and, and mapping strategies and moving forward. And, and 
I think a real strength of, of this initiative in Edmonton has been a, a, a robust effort of what, what that team has called community conversations, which are interviews or, or, or uh, discussion groups with families, agencies, and self-advocates. And to date, uh, uh, the, the, our Edmonton colleagues have, inter, uh, have had community conversations with, with over 100 stakeholders. So really getting a sense of what is the landscape for families. As we move to the Yukon, there has been substantial work in terms of capacity building and leveraging resources. You see the partners there in each of these regions. So this is a, 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 a really a collective work of, of many coming together at, at a common table to move forward. And the Yukon has focused on um, needs assessment and capacity building, uh, as it says there, with a focus on rural community development. And uh, so progress to date has included uh, the, the active engagement of key stakeholders, identifying priorities, um, discussing the purpose techniques and evaluation, and um, drawing on that collective impact the Yukon have really stressed, and we've appreciated this guidance, moving beyond proving in terms of evaluation to improving action uh, in terms of moving forward and, and seeing change on the ground amidst our evaluative aims in, in terms of understanding the processes and outcomes. Um, they, uh, the Yukon team has, have really focused on proactively addressing regional considerations including the uh, specifically the, the landscape of the Yukon, so uh, building capacity in rural regions. And, uh, and I, we applaud the work of the Yukon team. They have actually already established, uh, through this initiative, navigation services uh, within our, our rural community. So they are uh, uh, looking at that process and uh, terrific to see that forward movement already. Let's move on to Vancouver, who are also doing some terrific work uh, in improving the quality and experience of transitions for families through uh, Im improved navigation support and, and really thinking about that, what that uh, is and could be, looking at it through the lens, as you see there, of both local and, and provincial lenses. So local in terms of thinking about the transitional uh, and navigational processes for children and their families as they move from specialized provincial diagnostic services to community-based services and, and thinking about how does that seamlessly happen for families. And, um, and, and, and at provincial level, the aim of rendering navigational needs, processes, and resources, rendering them more visible in the landscape, which I think is a aim across our programs in terms of thinking about that and seeking increased seamlessness in terms of progress to date and next steps, so these are a range of points in terms of what has happened and what is 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 to happen. So certainly there has been a, a, a coming together of partners, as you see there, with a shared understanding of the issues and challenges, uh, identifying key issues and uh, a, a achievable objectives and moving forward in that as the aim, um, and, and moving towards uh, post-diagnostic diagnostic, follow-up uh, processes, really looking at those carefully and seeking to develop an inventory of, of provincial navigation systems and services, a planned navigator summit in BC, uh, and, uh, and then the increasing linkages in terms of uh, navigators and service providers working together across the spectrum, which I think is a challenge and a name of, of all of our sites in terms of how can we do better at working together across sectors, services, and and, uh, and and making that more seamless for families in terms of the, the pathways to getting what they need when they need it. Let's move to our, our the, the newest site in this initiative, which is Montreal. And, and uh, Montreal at, to date has, has focus on terms of reference development that is in process and setting priorities. So when we think about progress to date and next steps, some of these are, are yet to be done, but the a, a community, community conversation event um, it happened in November of last year uh, with, you'll see there, a, a, a cross 
uh, representation of government NGO and foundation sectors, which seems to be a pattern in our in our development that this isn't this is we can't do this alone. This is about working together better. Uh, so developing shared understanding of the challenges, gaps, and opportunities, the asset strengths, building a shared vision. Uh, uh, what is the aim? What are we working towards? And, and taking the time to develop that. And there is work to be done in terms of steering committee development. And you see some of the steps there that that are uh, underway or, or to be advanced uh, by that team as they move forward. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn the, the mic back over to Lucy, who's going to tie this presentation up with some kind of overarching uh, challenges and tensions uh, and observations as we move forward. Lucy? Lucy, do you, do you have your microphone muted? We can't hear you. I did. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Um, we have uh, been, you know, had several meetings now and uh, in both face to face and we've been meeting with the teams uh, by phone and uh, some of the findings from the work that they're doing and the conversations that we're having really has identified some um, some issues, some tensions, some challenges in this area of navigation uh, that I think are, are uh, is important to identify. Uh, when you bring sectors and parents and uh, NGO and foundations together, it's a really interesting process um, because they really grapple with uh, what can we do empowering and being empowered as an individual, a representative of an organization, a leader in a sector versus pointing a finger at somebody else saying they need to do something. Uh, that there's, you know, they meaning the government, the disembodied government has to, uh, pr you know, put more resources in. That's the that's the default. Um, okay, and, and what else needs to happen? And so we try. We're trying to move. Um, you know, obviously un understand that piece that there isn't enough money in the system, but also to see to look at what can we. What is the low hanging fruit? What can we be doing differently? What can we work on together? Um, as opposed to um, externalizing the responsibility for, for, for change. Another tension uh, or, or resolution that, that I think the teams are grappling with is to what extent is success going to be defined by systems changing the way they do things versus um, the family's experience, lived experience is what needs to change. And it's it's not an either or. I think this is a tent, you know, how much do we emphasize the success as being one or the other and, and the other, I should say, not or the other. Um, when you bring people together from uh, who are leaders in the government sectors, in the NGO sectors, inevitably there are those that are representing individual diagnoses such as cerebral palsy or autism or epilepsy. And we're very much looking at this issue across diagnoses. Um, that this is not an issue that's relegated to families of kids with autism, not, um, th that this is an issue that's experienced by families whose children have, sorry about that, whose children have brain-based developmental disorders. Finally, there are those who are um, representing also the pediatric sector, but, you know, kids grow up to be adults. So to what extent do we need to be thinking about um, navigation, not just for children, but also as children become adults, emerging adults, and the issues that that carries around, uh, you know, helping uh, families and systems to set up uh, supports that are meaningful uh, to and helpful to to given what the given what the issues are. So that's another tension I think that that we um, that we struggle with. David, could I have the next slide, please? Right, and so this idea that going coming back to our be the beginning where we spoke about case management versus good family care coordination versus this new phenomenon that we're calling navigation. How do we differentiate navigation? Is it different, um, or is it is it some 
Um, you know, is it, is, it a, is it another attempt to to uh, create something that in families are saying that they need um, that will be successful this time? Um, and then if we do create it, is it a model that's supposed to be implemented or is navigation something that that is comprised of principles that then are um, are grappled with and and implemented at the local level, depending on what the needs of a community are. So is it something that parents do, that the parents navigate these systems? Is it something that an individual does on behalf of parents? Um, or is it something that families experience about how systems of care interact and engage with one another versus some combination of all of the above? And I think where, where we're putting our, our emphasis is at the moment is really at the systems of care level. Um, when you build uh, relationships between systems of care, when you when systems of care begin to understand the kind of assets that they're bringing to the table and how those assets can be used to support building capacity within their organizations and how linkages and handovers can be perhaps uh, more smoother. Um, the, the experience that families have of moving through those systems uh, may improve. Lucy, if I can just add, if I can just add a point, I, I think that's such an important point, and we've grappled with um, the sometimes the lack of a, a definitional precision in navigation and its slippage to the quality of services. So, uh, rather than thinking about the the intersections uh, are, are between and across services as, as families seek to move between what they need and access, and that we've grappled in, in some of our, our uh, locations in terms of thinking carefully about this initiative is not so much about the quality of existing services, although it is that, but it's more so about how families manage the pathways to and within the, the service delivery system. And there's, there's a subtle uh, difference that we need to grapple with and, and think about that and, 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 and kind of think about it from a resource base, but also from an experiential base of families. Thanks, David. Um, and, you know, in, in uh, organizing these teams on the ground in Vancouver and in, in Edmonton in, in Whitehorse um, and, and in Montreal, um, there's been much reflection on who should be at the table and who else should be at the table. Um, and, and one of the sectors that is perhaps the um, the most challenging to engage, but also the most important or very important to engage is the education sector. You know, uh, if navigation has been really focused on primary care and health care and is expanded to social care and uh, social services, uh, we would argue that actually bringing education to the table is, is just as important, uh, but very challenging. Um, and then certainly around the evaluation component of these initiatives on, on the ground in these different sites, um, there, uh, the, the idea of, of developing evaluation mechanisms or systems that are useful um, versus, you know, set, setting up randomized control trials. And, you know, we spoke about the conventional evaluation that existed earlier and that, you um, uh, that's something that we're grappling with as well. So, so navigation is this idea as it being as being intersectoral work as being both an art and a science. Um, we we realize the the importance of uh, the need to build uh, relationships between systems and build trust. Um, that in in community engagement is has to be intentional. It has to be. Um, uh, it, we have to be vigilant in our in our efforts to to build those partners and bring people to the table. Um, and uh, the idea that this is a multifaceted uh, family and and and, a, and agency engagement process. Um, and we are uh, hoping to uh, continue this work going forward. Uh, and to engage more partners and and perhaps create more centers uh, going forward in the future. 
Okay, on that note, um, we'd like to say again, thank you to those who've attended, um, to the children and families who've, who have informed our work, to the regional partners and teams, once again, to Kids Brain Health Network and to the Israeli Foundation, as well as the multiple other donors who have provided uh, both cash and in-kind uh, support. So at this point, I, I don't know whether there, uh, Doug, whether there are questions from the audience, um, yeah. reflections that you would like to, we have some time left so we can entertain those. Yes, no, definitely there are there are quite a few questions and, and as well as reflections in in the in the in the hopper uh, right now. So, but great presentation. I mean, this is obviously a very important topic. We have a, quite a large audience. I think our largest audience uh, in quite a while uh, wow. attending this webinar. The, this whole concept of system navigation. We at Children's Healthcare Canada have been working with numerous organizations across the country and and local centers, et cetera, doing various things in this area of navigation. The folks at CHEO have been building a resource for families, uh, sort of using our knowledge exchange network platform. There's a link there for th for that. But but again, lots of people uh, uh, doing work in this area. And many of the comments here are talking about how can we get connected with you and your and your your work and, and the leads of these programs to learn more. So so we'll just start going through the some of the questions here. Uh, sure. The first question was just asking, uh, and, and is partially a comment, it's saying this work is definitely acknowledged in our partnership as a priority as a proven way to improve outcomes. However, they have lots of conversations uh, around the best use of resources insofar as does it make sense to hire dedicated navigators, for example, or is it better to build navigation skills into the service teams? What about building patient and family capacity? Uh, do, do the Just wondering if you guys have any, and I think you touched on some of this, but do you have any further thoughts on that? David, do you wanna take this? Sure, I can start. I, I, I think it's a terrific question and I, I really get it. different models. Um, and, and you know, it's interesting. I, I think in our work, there there have been kind of idiosyncratic areas of, of emphasis and fit in terms of, of where communities are at and where there is resonance in terms of, of models. So whether that be, um, you know, bringing navigators on board or or the skills building the the capacity and skills within communities and among uh, service providers and families and and I I think that kind of our approach is looking at the fit for the the region um, and um, you know I I don't think there's a strong base in in the literature to guide us in terms of you know what is more efficacious in terms of outcomes yet um, there are different models. And um, and I think of F. McBrien and et al.'s review that talked about the the benefit in terms of of outcomes of navigation, what, whatever approach you know there was different different models used. Um, I, I guess I would just comment on um, you know supporting families relative to navigating, but not relegating families to the responsibility of of that process. So how can we support families to make the pathway easier? And uh, and so I, I, I guess my, my concern is not to uh, move to a model where the, the responsibility for navigation is just about more sort of more training for families, but, but not an infrastructure of support within the system to, to truly make that path easier for families. I would agree. Yeah, I would agree with David in this in that sense. In, in, even in our pro project to date, the way in which these uh, sites are are thinking about navigation really varies. I mean, in the Yukon, what they've done is is hired somebody to be a navigator in the community to to and in BC, what they're doing is they're mapping or doing an environmental scan of where navigation actually exists in the systems to, to render it more visible to both to families and to service providers as a first step. Uh, so I think one of the principles that we're operating by is that communities need to come together and decide for themselves what they're, what, how, how to make this happen and what, what needs to happen and what do they have the energy and the resources and the desires for. Uh, rather than imposing at this point a top-down um, uh, model, I don't know if that answers the question. 
I'm sure it doesn't. If there, if it doesn't, please do uh, to type in a follow up, and we'll we'll certainly come back to that if if, it, if the question was not fully answered. But uh, we did have a few questions uh, asking about uh, access to the slides and and the recordings as well. And I just want to just make people aware there is a spot in your con little control panel there for the webinar uh, where you can download a PDF copy of these slides, and the re this webinar is recorded and will be made available after the fact. I uh, just want to make sure people are aware of that. Um, the next one. Uh, Comment again coming in, just talking about needing to doing similar work and needing to get connected here. Uh, just saying thank you for sharing. They they need to get connected to all these leads from each province as currently they are working on a similar research study related to the transitions in care for medically fragile and technology uh, te technology dependent children in southwestern Ontario, which includes rural and remote. And they have many partners as well and will be using multiple strategies in this research. So again, people again doing lots of work in this area looking to get connected that how will we what can, will you be able to pass that on to us as to who that is would be more than happy to connect yeah i'd certainly be happy to make uh, to make that connection for sure thank you yeah and i would just add to i it's, it's a wonderful comment and it reminds me of something that we didn't say but we should have which is really that there are some what we've learned even in our regions where we're we sort of we're focused our jurisdictions, let alone the rest of the country. They're just terrific pockets of work going on. And um, so I really appreciate that question because I think it does speak to an issue and and I think a real commitment and desire of of some of our 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 funders and and kind of key movers in this area, I think of the Kids Brain Health Network and Azraeli Foundation that are really ha have really conveyed, a desire to kind of integrate the important work and, and the expansive work of this. And so I, I just agree with that comment that the importance of finding pathways to kind of come together and, and to uh, kind of integrate the good learning that is happening across the country. And uh, we, Lucy gave a few examples of some of the the literature, so the academic work that has summed up some of that work, but within communities in, at the practice and programmatic and and uh, kind of systems level, there's terrific work happening. So so the more that we can integrate and leverage that work, I think that we'll 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 get to those aims that we were talking about that much quicker and 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 in the process learn from each other and and the kind of the some of the hard lessons along the way that we've we've grappled with and in, in, in moving the needle. Um, do, do you think it would be possible, uh, uh, Lucy and, and David, uh, to type your whatever contact information you think would be, uh, you know, the, the best way for people to get in touch with you into the chat box to me? And I can push that out to uh, to the audience just so they have it. I just read a couple other comments here. The social worker uh, with the Central Zone uh, Children's Rehabilitation Services in Alberta just completed a major navigation project five years ago that changed the way they connect with families uh, with their uh, speech language uh, pathologists, OTs and PTs services for families just again wondering if they can uh, connect we have a volunteer co-lead of a provincial project co-designed with citizens called healthcare 101 in Alberta uh, currently working on topic two finding my way uh, they published in for Albertans in uh, June of 2018 um, they've just got a, a, an article here that I can paste in the chat box uh, but again would love to connect uh, uh, with uh, with everyone as, or with with you as well so if, if you were able to do that that would just I think that'd be a quick easy way to make sure we get that at least some basic uh, contact information out and I'll just put this uh, link to that article in the in the chat box and as well as uh, uh, Lucy and David's uh, email addresses it's just the email email addresses, but it's pretty obvious uh, whose is whose. So, so I just uh, just am sticking those in the in the chat box for for both Lucy and David. And you know, again, I'm, they're more than happy to uh, to connect if you want to reach out and you know and continue this uh, conversation afterwards. We are we are at just about out of time, just a minute left. There are quite a few more questions. I'm going to try and sneak a couple more in if people are able to stick around for just a couple more. Uh, uh, just a couple more minutes while we try to get a couple more of these questions in there. Um, the next question that came in is just uh, asking about, or just saying, has there been any group that is using the lived experience of families to inform other families? Are there measurements and are there measurements of whether this is as successful or more successful than hiring yet another healthcare provider uh, to person to interact with? 
Right. So I think you're talking, the question has to do with parent to parent support or peer support um, and whether that is more effective than uh, some other, you know, professional provided support. I'm not aware of those, that particular comparison being, um, being made. Um, uh, certainly increasingly because parents are telling us that this is what's needed. I'm going out there and talking to, you know, health and social service agencies to say, geez, you know, what would it be like if you deployed in, you know, reallocated your resources to, to building, supporting the development of a network like this. Um, and that's been kind of um, uh, an interesting um, cause, cause some organizations to reflect on whether they could shift uh, their their funding in and in, in that direction, and some have, but I'm not aware of there being any about the evaluation per se. David, um, I, I no, I would concur with your comments, and, and uh, you know some of the some of the uh, anecdotal observations or or uh, qualitative observations are that um, f- families are are uh, seeking navigational support but as well as, so along with, connection with other parents. So Lucy's earlier point around the value of learning from other parents, but also the solidarity and reciprocity of someone who has walked a similar journey uh, has emerged as as so critical in terms of learning, but also uh, not feeling alone in the journey. Mm. It's such an important question. And, And I think your question really speaks to the importance of of developing uh, uh, resources to evaluate the impact in order to move that field forward. All right. Uh, another comment here that came in about uh, you know just, just reflecting on the, the the question about support and navigating and responsibility. They they thought that was an interesting point. They're wondering what are the, if you have any ideas about how this happens once youth uh, a youth has transitioned to adult care where they spend a greater length of time. Have we set up uh, people to have greater hope during childhood, that which is then reduced in in adulthood. That whole, that classic falling off the cliff when you turn eighteen and you don't have access to this kind of thing anymore. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a, such an important question, and um, you know, I I think that uh, the one example that we have in terms of this project is the the uh, Alberta group uh, is, is and, and one component of the work is focusing on um, navigation from a lifespan perspective. And, um, and, and, you know, I think there's a lot of thinking to do in terms of the, the runway to adulthood and how do we create navigational supports around key transitions. And, and, uh, and I think that the point around supporting people to make that transition, but also seeing advocacy for access to services, in this case, in adulthood, as part of that uh, navigational and, and advocacy landscape and moving forward. So uh, to, to really, to your, to your words, Doug, so we, we begin to push against the cliff and rather think about seamlessness of resources from a lifespan perspective. I think if a community identifies that that's a priority for them, uh, then that is uh, definitely, uh, you know, a place to go. And in terms of bringing organizations together around um, and building capacity for that, for improving that transition. Certainly in Montreal, that is a theme that's that's come up loud and clear. The issue of housing uh, or developing housing for um, for young adults or emerging adults. Uh, as they as they get you know become older has uh, has emerged and there's a group that's starting to look at that here so it's for sure I think it's again it's community contingent it, there's so much to be done I guess the last one of the last things I wanted to speak to is is um, how our the partnership model that we have been working w- um, under or with has actually um, brought gotten the attention of governments uh, our gov- our respective governments and they're they're coming to the, they're 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 to different to varying degrees they're coming to the table because they're they want to listen um and to hear what what's happening on the ground so i'm very excited about that um i think that has some tremendous potential uh, it, there is a decided political component to this uh, to this work, and so having them, um, uh, having their ear has has uh, I've been extremely grateful 
uh, for, for that. And Lucy, if I could just add, I think a nice way to end and an important way to end is uh, to to this question. Um, we some of the data collection in, at, at, at particular sites have been uh, inclusive of self advocates who are reflecting on their experiences and what they would like to see in terms of the pathways, both both as they reflect on childhood processes, childhood and adolescence, but also into adulthood. And um, and I think that. Um, that notion of nothing about us without us is is so integral and important uh, so that uh, uh, individuals uh, with neurodisabilities uh, are given the space and the voice to be commentators on this process so they can really speak to what they need and want as they move forward, just as it's important to, to hear the, the, the experiences of families. And that, that has, we've really tried to make that a kind of a fundamental principle of this work, which I think is so important to, to continue to move forward. And I do think that is a great place to, to, to leave it off with. I mean, it's such a great sort of way to, to wrap this up. Maybe we'll go back just one more time to, to each of you. Just maybe there's so much interest in this topic. Maybe if you could give people a, an idea of where they should go for more information what or what's next for this this research is there is there more to come uh, you know around this project or or is that still sort of undecided? If you just give us a little sense of of where people could could go next, since there is clearly so much uh, interest in this. Well, it's certainly we are uh, not we are not even at the we are nowhere near the end of this process. We are very much at the beginning of this process. So um, you know, at a year from now, we'd be happy to come back and speak again about where where things are at and what we've learned. Um, people can contact us directly as well, uh, and be more than happy. I've already received a couple of emails from folks while I've been on the um, on this call um, asking for more information. So. Um, we are in the process of writing up our um, the, the sort of the beginning stages and for publication as well. So uh, we'll be happy to share that. All yeah. right. Sorry, looking go ahead. All, sorry, looking also at the KBHN website would um, would provide some. Um, w- there'll be updates there. And along along with the terrific work going on in other parts of the country, if if uh, different regions are interested in kind of thinking about engaging in this kind of work or hearing more about it you know these we this is these are four communities but there's many more so if people are interested we we just welcome the opportunity to kind of explore that with with different regions and and different individuals so thanks for that opportunity all right well thank you very much and as you as you saw lucy the people already starting to reach out if people did not see the the email addresses there or have any trouble getting in touch with uh, david or lucy please don't hesitate to contact us at children's Healthcare canada and we'll be happy to uh, to make sure you uh, you you get you get in touch so thanks again for a great uh, topic we certainly will be uh, holding you to that in a year's time i will be looking for another presentation to see where things are at because uh, again i just can't overstate how, how much interest there is in in this topic so Hmm. All right. Thank thank you for inviting us, Doug. It was certainly our pleasure. All right. We do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And when you do get to watch live, uh, as you can see, you do get to inject your questions and your comments. And I do apologize to those uh, whose questions we did not get to. But again, please do do not hesitate to follow up with David and Lucy. And when you can't watch live, though, uh, we do record these sessions and make them available after the fact on the Knowledge Exchange Network. And those of you registered for the webinar today will receive an email with a link to uh, the the page on our Knowledge Exchange Network that will have the recording as well as the the PDF copy of the uh, of the slides. Uh, our webinar next week uh, on February 6th will focus on empowering women leaders in health in health and healthcare. And we'll be welcoming for that session, Dr. Ivy Bourgeau from the University of Ottawa. And she's also the Canadian, uh, the CIHR, Canadian Institutes of Health Research, uh, Chair in Gender, Work and Health Human Resources. And she will provide uh, an overview of the state of knowledge about women's leadership in the domains of healthcare, health sciences and indigenous indigenous health contexts. And she will also share some promising practices to help women achieve uh, leadership roles in these areas. So uh, a very interesting session coming up up uh, next week for those interested in in leadership and healthcare. So thanks again for joining us today. And uh, hopefully we will uh, see everyone back here next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye for now.